Good evening. Um, I want to welcome you to John Carroll University. I'm Mary Beadle, the chair of the Tim Russert Department of Communication and Theater Arts. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Professor Joe Treister, the Knight Chair in Cross-Cultural Communication at the University of Miami, and our Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellow. The Russert Department was very happy to learn this past spring when we were notified we had received a Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellow Award. We were especially happy to learn that Professor Treister knew Tim Russert. The Visiting Fellow Program provides speakers to colleges and universities for week-long visits by experts in a variety of areas to work with faculty and students on important issues of the day. It's sponsored by the Council of Independent Colleges, which provides programs overall to improve the quality of education. During this week, Professor Treister will have visited classes in education, journalism, religious studies, biology, just to name a few. Um, I really would like to thank the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Jean Colloran, who right from the beginning, when I thought we should apply for this award, supported me 110%. And I also want to thank my fellow faculty for all their kind invitations to have uh, Professor Treister attend their classes. Thank you very much for your interest. Professor Treister worked as a foreign correspondent for the New York Times for 30 years, reporting from more than 80 countries. And he received numerous awards, including three overseas press awards. His work included reporting from Vietnam, where he was asked to provide a TV in exchange for information. But he didn't give the bribe, but he did get the information. But I gather he wasn't too popular in Vietnam. He also covered the illegal drug trade, dr tra drug traffic, and found himself in cocaine fields of South America and threatened by drug dealers in New York. He reported on hurricanes all over the world, including Hurricane Katrina. During Katrina, he was in police headquarters as the hurricane struck and happened to be sitting next to the 911 operator and was able to hear the emergency calls as they came in. His work resulted in a book, Hurricane Force, and the Path of America's Deadliest Storms. But this um, occurrence also led him to his interest in the global environmental crisis, and in particular, the crisis of water. In a blog post on One Water, talking about the difficulty of getting governments to spend money on water projects rather than fancy new stadiums, he said that water projects are not interesting, but they undergird everything else in society. So we're very happy and pleased to present Joe Treister and look forward to his insights on the worldwide water crisis. Joe. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Beating. So, uh, really, good evening. This is my first time in Cleveland and the first time at John Carroll University. I've been having a great time here with the students and faculty. Um, I know I'm not really in Cleveland. I know it's, uh, it's University Heights, but I think I'm pretty close to Cleveland. Uh, and um, I was just on my way down to the uh, river and the lake uh, uh, when I had some kind of peculiar virus strike me. So I, I haven't yet seen the river and the lake, but uh, I'm hoping I can do that before I leave. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Mary Beadle very much. For the, she's the chairman of the Tim Resser Department of Communication and Theater Arts, as you know. Thank her very much for inviting me here as a Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellow. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think so. She's put in a lot of work, uh, and uh, I've been very busy here. I've talked to lots of classes. I have more classes to talk to, and now I've got a chance to talk with you all tonight. I also want to thank um, Matt Crow, a graduate assistant in the Russert Department, uh, who, who gave me a great deal of help in the final shaping of the video that you're going to see tonight. Uh, it's especially significant for me to be here tonight uh, at this school that commemorates the life and the work of Tim Russert. He and I worked on opposite sides of the tracks early in our careers. I met him when I was a reporter at the New York Times, and he was an aide to Senator Patrick Moynihan of New York. Senator Moynihan was the kind of thoughtful, articulate public official that nowadays seems almost too good to be true. Tim Russert was a perfect sidekick for the senator. He was quick and sharp. He knew the issues inside out. 
He seemed to have the complete trust of the senator, and he was always there when I had a story to write that was about something in the senator's field. And that could be just about anything. The senator's wisdom ran broad and deep, and so did Tim's. Tim later worked for Mario Cuomo, the governor of New York. Mario Cuomo is another one of those thinking political leaders. Tim was an extraordinary political aide, and he became an extraordinary journalist in Washington. His Meet the Press uh, program on Sunday mornings was always something you didn't want to miss. I admired Tim Russert for his work, and I admired the way he made his transition to television. I was in an airport waiting for a flight when the news came on the TV screen that Tim had collapsed at his desk at NBC and died suddenly. I, like so many people, <clears throat> I was staggered. I thought about his wife, Maureen, who I'd <clears throat> uh, known when she was a writer at New York Magazine. I thought about their son, Luke. The world had lost a great man. I want to talk with you tonight about something that I'm sure would have engaged Tim Russert. It involves people all over the world. Many people call it the worldwide water crisis. It is mostly about the difficulty of people, hundreds of millions of people, simply to get clean drinking water for themselves and their families. For a lot of people in Africa and parts of Asia and other poor places in the world, a normal day is a day drinking water that is loaded with bacteria and parasites and virus. These men and women and children are, are often sick, and for them, this is just the way things are. They have never known a different way of life. This is what normal is for a lot of people. It's a lovely place to get your drinking water, as you can see. This is just milky. Uh, I can't tell you what's in that water, and neither can the man trying to get some of it. He's got himself a plastic bucket. He's going to be walking off, and that's going to be his drinking water. This, um, this shouldn't, let's see, we're going to see a few more of our pictures of people going through this difficult time. D difficult, I mean, look at this. This, this water is shameful. Uh, but, um, uh, here, you know, all too often people just go down on their hands and knees and drink right up, straight away. Uh, here's a girl, uh, uh, that big yellow can, uh, I'll tell you more about that later, but that can, almost the size of the girl, is the sort of thing that women carry on their backs for long, long hikes to get water from a river or a lake for their families. Now, this happens to be uh, a, a I'm pretty sure this is a slum in Africa, and there's a pumping station there. Whether the water's clean or not is always a question. Okay, what else? Uh, all right, and so there's more of the same thing. Always getting this rather cruddy looking water and taking it home to drink. Uh, this kind of thing shouldn't be normal, and it certainly has terrible consequences. Not having safe, clean drinking water means you can't go to work the way you'd like to. You can't make it to school. It means you can't get ahead financially. And it means the countries in which these people live don't advance the way they should. We've got water problems in, in the United States. Excuse me. The drought we're seeing in the Southwest is very serious. But the day-to-day -day personal strain is of a different magnitude. It's not life or death for us. In Africa and parts of Asia, people die as a result of drinking the only water available to them. The United Nations tracks these things, and the statistics are shocking. Nearly 800 million people in Africa, Asia, and other parts, poor parts of the world don't have safe, clean drinking water. Every day they drink water that's unhealthy. Uh, the women <clears throat> do a lot of walking, as I mentioned before. Here you'll just see, this is, this is obviously pretty parched land, uh, and uh, we, we have a, a series of scenes here with women uh, walking along, carrying this stuff. They spend an inordinate amount of time on this. They, that, that means they can't work at anything but collecting water. Their children, here's a pretty young woman, she should be in school, she's out hauling water. To get the water, people have to do a lot of work, as I said. They have to walk up to several hours a day, and uh, most of it is women and young people like this. 
Um, now, um, these are folks who don't have any kind of plumbing near them. Now, we have a, a for many people, getting a hand pump is a step up. Uh, whoops, here's some more. This is more toting of water. Here we are in Asia. Uh, and this man here is, um, is the water man. He makes a, makes a living carrying water around and selling it to people. So he's, uh, he's an entrepreneur who figured out that some people would rather buy water than walk for it. And I saw people filling these kinds of jugs and containers in East Africa near Lake Victoria. And you would hardly believe the look of the pond they were taking the water from. It was, it was worse than any of the pictures you've seen so far. Um, the man puts this uh, water in these jugs, sells it to people. People should be boiling it, they don't. Um, here, as I said, a step up. You, uh, you get a pump and you don't have water in your house, but at least you have it in a place that's a little closer. Um, there's another problem that's very related here. The United Nations calls it sanitation. What the UN means when they say that is toilets. Now, uh, excuse me, but the, this fellow here has slightly improved water. The, you notice he's not at a riverbed. He's he's in a, in a in probably he's in a in a small village, and this water is coming to him. Um, we have a couple of other shots here of improve here. These this is a standpipe. Um, the aim is for this water to be clean. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But it, it does slow down, you know, it, it takes the place of all that walking. Now, uh, this sanitation issue I was talking about, it really is toilets. Um, uh, about 2.5 billion people, that's billion with a B, 35% uh, of all the people on Earth don't have toilets. It's, it's hard to believe as we gather here tonight at John Carroll University, a, a comfortable, beautiful place. But it's a fact. 2.5 billion people don't have a place to go to the bathroom. They have to find some place outdoors. They don't even have outhouses. A farmer uh, not long ago in Kenya showed me how he dug holes in his yard to use as toilets. He and his wife would go to the hole in the yard and then cover their waist with dirt. When the hole filled up, they would dig another one. So I met other people in a slum on the edge of Nairobi who went to the bathroom in plastic bags. They would uh, do what they had to do, then they would just throw the bags over their shoulder. They, now, this, of course, gets into the streets. It mingles with everything. Uh, see, well, I guess we can go to the next slide. Uh, here's an example of uh, these. Uh, this is a, a village or a slum. This uh, waterway through there is a toilet. Um, it's a sewer. Now the next picture shows you, this is another pretty awful place. Slums in, in uh, Africa look a lot like this, and it's, it's very unhealthy. Um, the lack of water and the lack of toilets means that people often carry disease on their hands. It means that when it rains, human waste washes into rivers and lakes where people fetch their drinking water. In some cases, people wade into the rivers and lakes and use them as toilets. The result is a lot of diarrhea, a lot of dehydrating sickness. This is most devastating to very young children and older people. Parents often don't realize how sick their children are, how dehydrated they've become. Over and over, I, I hear stories of children dying on the way to the hospital or dying shortly after they've reached the hospital. Each year, nearly two million People die from drinking unclean water, and most of them are under five years of age. Uh, now, in Africa and India, as one Western writer put it, the water crisis is right in your face. In the United States and Europe, it's somewhat remote. For us in the developed world, the drinking water crisis is a humanitarian issue. It is something for Americans and people in other prosperous countries to try to remedy. It's something that you and John Carroll University can help with. The combination of the lack of clean drinking water and the lack of toilets has given us a stubborn problem. This is the most acute aspect of the worldwide water crisis. 
There are many elements in the water crisis, but I think this is the aspect to focus on. All these things that I've been talking to you about, the health, the lack of clean water, the lack of sanitation, these, are, these don't take rocket science to resolve. We know how to do it. We're not getting the job done. It's, um, it's also, unlike some things about the environment, it's not a potential problem. It's a problem right now. And uh, it's something that could be fixed, and that really makes it troubling. Um, Coordination and money have been the stumbling blocks. And I think that boils down to commitment, social commitment, social justice. Something that you believe in strongly at John Carroll, and that I think we have not seen enough of from the people who've been dealing with the worldwide water crisis. Tens of thousands of people are working on the water problem. Someone needs to come up with an idea of how to make all the work move in the same direction. Some of the work is being done in small villages, some in clusters of villages, some in slums. Sometimes the solution is to distribute water, water purification tablets. In India and in Bangladesh, they found they can get a lot, out of, a lot of the bad stuff out of water simply by straining it through sari material, the material that women make their dresses from. Some of the humanitarian organizations drill wells. Some install pumps. Some Still others believe the answer is to build big water treatment plants and lay down miles of pipe. There are many more kinds of projects. They are all useful, but for one reason or another, they often don't fit together. You get a little benefit for a while, then the project falls apart. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, has come to the same conclusion. The problem, he says, is that we have no coordinated global management authority in the UN system or the world at large. Nobody's in charge. Water, climate change, and the global food problem share a common burden, he says. There is no overall responsibility, accountability, or vision. So a lot of people trying to do good things but not being able to pull it off. A lot of money has been spent but there's never been enough. It's always looked like a patchwork of Band-Aids. One big burst of maybe 50 or 60 billion could have a tremendous impact. Some world leaders understand that, but still the money flows fall short of the need. There ought to be a way to make a bigger dent in this problem. The United Nations has been the biggest, most consistent soldier in the battle. Its research and its goal setting have improved the situation. There was a time, for example, when it wasn't two million people dying every year from sickness derived from water, it was five million. The United Nations has designated 2013 as the International Year of Water Cooperation. It is all about the problems of coordination. They call it water management, uh, but it, it's coordination, cooperation. Um, it's people working together in a more productive way than they've been able to do it so far. Two years ago, the United Nations General Assembly declared that having safe, clean drinking water and clean functioning toilets was a fundamental human right. You would have thought that was understood, that you wouldn't have to have a formal declaration. But many people think that a formal declaration added a bit of pressure on governments in developing countries to do the right thing and to make more of an effort on water. As Mary said at the beginning here, for too many people in government, water is not a glamorous enough issue. I hear over and over how ministers and prime ministers in developing countries much prefer to open up big buildings, big facilities, even water treatment plants to, to working on some projects that might be more effective. They like the ribbon cutting ceremony. It's, it's, it has a bigger bang politically for them. And we end up not getting the job done uh, in some meaningful way. We can learn a lot from the worldwide water, water crisis right here. We're not being hit by the worst elements of it. But one thing you learn is that water simply can't be taken for, for granted. Scientists are telling us that more difficult days are coming and that we need to start conserving water and making the, better, the, be, making the best uses of water we have. The biggest environmental issue today is climate change. It's going to put more strain on the world's water supply. 
We're expecting longer droughts and more heavy rainfall and severe flooding. In flooding, the earth does not absorb the water as well when we have moderate rain, as when we have moderate rains, and we lose a lot of that rushing water. It also leads to pollution because just as here in Cleveland and, and uh, Buffalo and some other big cities, um, the sewer system is such that when you have a heavy uh, rain and you gotta get that land, that water off the land, um, the sewer systems reach a certain point and then all the water flows together, the sewage and the rain water, and that leads to more pollution, more contamination. So uh, we've gotta take care of that. Furthermore, our planet is also growing more crowded. We have about the same amount of water all the time. It recycles and we use it again and again. So the more people there are, the more people we have to share water with. We're at about seven billion people now. In less than 15 years, we'll be living with eight billion people. In about 30 years, there'll be nine billion of us. So, the worst impact from climate change and population growth are a long way off. That makes it hard for some people to get excited. I think there's a growing awareness that we've got to work to slow global warming. You need to use less gasoline, for example. And we're seeing people moving toward hybrid cars and cars with more mileage. Um, it wasn't too long ago you couldn't give an electric car away. Now people are starting to line up for them. Right now, we're in the midst of a rough battle for the presidency of the United States. The economy, jobs, and health care are the big issues. You're not hearing much about the environment. I think this is a blip. I think if you go beyond the battle for the presidency, you see a substantial amount of coverage of the environment in newspapers, on television, and radio. I, when I was coming in on Sunday, I stopped uh, to change planes in Detroit. Uh, there was a huge story. Uh, about uh, a, a chemical disaster decades ago uh, on the front page of the, of the uh, Detroit Free Press, and uh, a, a story that they invested a lot of time in doing. It was a, uh, a pollution uh, that, uh, that ended up killing a lot of cattle, and uh, when I was in Michigan last year, I met people who said that some of the residue was in the water and uh, some water systems were being changed. Anyway, it's a big story, but it took a lot of effort for the pre-press staff to get that together. The same day, there was a huge story on the front page of USA Today. So I, I have some, uh, I'm encouraged to see that serious publications, serious broadcasters are dealing with this subject. And just because the presidential campaign isn't dealing with it right now, I think they've got good reason to, to be focused on the economy. So when you look at the internet, the environment's all over the internet. It, it really is a big issue here. It's not quite the hot issue that the economy is right now, but there was a moment a few decades ago when things were different, when worries about the environment were the big thing in America. A good deal of the momentum came from right around here, Cleveland. Many of you tonight may remember the shock around America when the Cuyahoga River burst into flames in the summer of 1969. Here's the uh, administrator, former administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, she was in office much, some many years after that fire in June of 1969 and you can see what an impact it had on her. Um, uh, the river became a symbol for the sickening pollution in the country's rivers and lakes. A big oil spill off Santa Barbara, California added to the anxiety. We reached a tipping point then and good things began to happen. In the spring of 1970, the year after the Cuyahoga River caught fire, 20 million Americans in one single day went into the streets to protest the sorry state of the environment. It was our first National Earth Day. Later in 1970, Congress established the Clean Air Act. A short time later, we got the Clean Water Act. President Nixon, in 1970, created the Environmental Protection Agency. Time Magazine was a powerhouse then, must reading for many Americans. Time Magazine called 1970 the year of the environment. We are now 
nowhere near that level of intensity on the environment. But when a fight for the White House isn't drowning out almost everything else, the environment gets a fair amount of attention. It should get more attention. People here at the Tim Russert Department of Communication and Theater Arts can help. John Carroll is a place where social commitment, social justice is important. A future, as future journalists and communicators of one kind or another, the students in the uh, Tim Russert Department of Communication can take it upon themselves to understand the main points on the environment and to write articles and tell visual stories and let the rest of the world see what is happening. And that needs to, be, that needs to happen. I'm working on this in Miami with the publication I edit, the MiamiPlanet.org. This is the uh, front page of the Miami Planet. And um, uh, this is a student uh, uh, reported, to some extent student edited. Uh, and um, it, um, it is trying to cover uh, all global issues. We have a starting point for Miami, but we have partners in other cities. Uh, and uh, Dr. Beadle and I have been talking about the possibility that students here at John Carroll may be able to contribute to a section of our of the paper. Uh, let me show you here. This is a section called Galapagos Diary. Uh, and this is the work of students who went this summer with me to the Galapagos Islands off Ecuador, about 600 miles out in the Pacific. And each of these articles you see on the screen is four, five, six hundred words of students on that trip putting together what they've learned into a nice narrative that helps other people understand what a, what a marvel the, the Galapagos Islands are and also what, um, uh, you know, what things can, uh, you know, what things need defending. Uh, one of the problems in the Galapagos is too many people want to go to the Galapagos. So, we, you know, 170,000 or so a year is a bit much. Now, the government of Ecuador um, does a pretty good job of, of regulating the flow of tourists. So I don't feel it's being overrun, but it's a lot of people. Um, and uh, so as they move ahead and put in new hotels and new, new facilities for tourists, I think almost everybody wants to make sure they put those in in a way that doesn't hurt the place. Um, the, uh, the planet, uh, one of the objectives of the planet, besides the advancement of the students in learning about the environment and writing about it, is to get people around the globe engaged in the environment. We write our stories in a way that we think will engage people who don't necessarily have an interest in the environment. But when they see the story, it's about people, it's about issues, uh, and uh, our technique is that we will focus in on something on the Galapagos, and then after you've just started reading it, we'll say, and this thing that we're telling you about in the Galapagos is emblematic of things that are going on in the world. Um, and so I think readers can connect with it. They can see that we're not talking about some, to some people, relatively remote place like the Galapagos, but we're saying here the Galapagos is part of this global picture. And so we're getting a lot of support from people everywhere. I also take students to the university, to uh, Sweden, uh, and students in Sweden uh, write these same kinds of articles. Of course, Sweden is one of the most developed places, and we go there because it's a model of what to do right in the environment. Um, we're, uh, we, we've, we've turned the uh, Galapagos project into a joint work with our School of Music. Uh, we who are not in the School of Music are, te are, are teaching the students about the environment and the key issues, and we're also working with them on, on getting their thoughts and ideas and information they've reported, getting that across forcefully and clearly. The music people show all the students in this project how to use tape recorders to capture all the sounds of the, all the natural sounds there. Uh, everything from the sea lions and the blue-footed boobies uh, to, uh, to the sounds of the wind up around the volcano tops, uh, the sounds of waves, and, and the students um, 
are further engaged with the environment that way, and, the, and then the result of their work is a one-hour music CD. And uh, so all of that is storytelling, and that's why we think there's a pedagogic uh, value to this teamwork between the School of the, uh, Music and the uh, School of Communication. Uh, I don't know of any place else where those two schools are working together, and uh, we are trying, to, all of us, people here at the Tim Russert's department and everyone in communication these days is trying to figure out how to more effectively communicate and how to, how to uh, be able to be a, a voice and a channel for information to people who are confronted by all kinds of new developments, including such an array on the internet that you may not know exactly where to look. So, not everybody is going to be a journalist or a communication specialist, but all of you can pay more attention to how we use water and, and how we waste water, and we can all get better at conservation. We all need to keep an eye on what our elected leaders are doing, and we need to let them know that we're concerned about the environment. A big reason the economy is crucial in the presidential election is because that's what people say is worrying them. The big economic picture, jobs, health, sorry, jobs, health care, uh, all that's related. Our elected leaders need to be reminded regularly that we are concerned about the health of the planet. You can make sure they know you care. You can write letters. You can write emails. You can make, as journalists, you can write articles and make videos for large audiences. A real beauty of the field of journalism is that you, could, you find information that's meaningful and you reach a lot of people. Uh, it's a form of public service. And uh, so whether you're a journalist or whether you're an individual, there are things you can do about nudging the, the elected officials. If you don't let them know there's something important to you, there isn't really any way they're going to know about it. Uh, you, you, know, you can just see how obsessive everyone is about the economy right now. I don't recommend anybody try to argue about the importance of the economy. We can see how important it is. But I also know once these two guys get the fired, finished fighting with each other and we elect one of them, then I think we'll be able to be a little more reflective and we'll be able to pick up the steam on the environment. So, uh, so I think, the, the, you know, for the several reasons, the environment's a little fuzzy right now. We do, uh, you know, the crisis at home isn't quite what it was back when the Cuyahoga River was burning. We don't have clouds of smoke choking the cities. Uh, the lakes and rivers aren't quite as polluted. They're not perfect by any means, but uh, it's nothing like the bad old days. And the big issue of climate change mostly seems way off in the future. The important related issue of water seems less pressing for Americans. The idea of turning a faucet on at home and not getting a gush of clean, safe water is so far from... There you are. Oh. That's just this, the thing up there is... Oh, okay. This thing just has a little... Yeah, burp, so, we, so we need to go a little forward. We're, we're, yeah, oh, sorry, God. You were right, and I was wrong. <laughs> oh, he had a surprise for you. you. Trust <laughs> <laughs> she told me to trust her, right. The idea of turning a faucet on at home and not getting a gush of clean, safe water is so far from reality for most Americans that the world water crisis is almost unimaginable. But we're at a university this evening. We're at John Carroll University. We are together a group of thinking people. Here's President Niehoff. John Carroll University believes in social justice and social commitment. You are people who, who, who can make a difference, who I know are trying to make a difference, and you are making a difference. I think many of you are going to go out and do it, We're talking about students now. Your professors are helping you prepare. I think we all know you can do it. You can really make a difference. You really can. I want to thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd love to have questions from you. So I think this is on. Now is it on?
on now. Okay, so who has questions? Okay, yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I, this is sort of a comment question. I'm wondering how how much advancement has been made um, with dealing with some of the cultures, particularly in Africa. I was in Uganda in the Peace Corps in 68 and 69. Yeah. And uh, we went on a health project actually to try to cure trachoma, which is a blinding disease over yeah. there. But one of the thrusts of our, our focus was um, to try to get people to have better hygiene. So we would have uh, felt board lectures, on the importance of using latrines, which we built. And um, uh, we found that it was very difficult. The people enjoyed our lectures. They listened to us. They were very friendly. They yeah. appreciated our being there. But we found that it was very difficult to convince them, for example, to use a latrine rather than go out behind a banana tree behind your hut yeah. and just do what you said people do, you know. They didn't even have plastic bags. They would use a big banana leaf and just throw it on the ground, and it would be maybe near a water source or maybe not. But that, and um, we, we found out eventually by one of the guys that used to drink wargi and smoke pot with, with some of the people in the village, he was a wonderful source of information of what they were really thinking, um, that, for example, the women were afraid for cultural reasons to use a latrine because they felt if they sat on uh, a thing with a, a big black deep hole that there might be spirits that would come up and zap their uterus and they yeah. could have no more children and boy in the bush you've got to have seven, eight kids because some of them won't make it right. to take care of you in your old age. So that's a long way of asking how do you deal with the cultural ramifications you can build wells, you can tell people, you can tell people to use water purification mm -hmm. tablets, which you're saying many don't, right. or boil their water, many don't. Mm -hmm. How do you get to the bottom of changing those habits so that people actually take advantage of the new technology that help them with clean water? Well, I've had some of the same experiences uh, in uh, Kenya, right next to Uganda. Um, I talk to people in all different places, in, in, in the towns, in the slums, in the countryside. And um, I was really quite surprised to hear a man in the slums telling me, we don't really need water purification tablets here. I don't know why the government gives them to us. They don't give them as many as we need, and they, they, they're, they're, they're not really available. But nobody cares because the water's just fine. You get sick here in Africa because that's what happens in Africa. You know, it's, it's a form of normal, as I was saying in my talk. Um, I, I think it's, uh, the, the solution is somewhere in there to this overriding problem that Ban Ki-moon is talking about and that I'm becoming more and more aware of, is that we just can't figure out how to manage it. We cannot, uh, you know, as you said, you, you, you talk to people about sanitation and the importance of it. You show the, uh, a toilet and, uh, and how that keeps the water source from being polluted. And, you know, maybe you showed them hand washing. A lot of people do that. Um, I hear from many people in this field, this sort of social work in the water sanitation area, is that the message, uh, that there's a lot of rotation uh, with a, of, the, of the message givers. Like the, the Peace Corps people were, you, or I think they're on assignment for a year or two. Was that, you were in Uganda for two years? Yeah, well, you know, two years you'd think would be enough time to, uh, to get people getting used to you and listening to what you're saying and then seeing some proof that, uh, that when you wash your hands and when you uh, use toilets, things get better. Um, so turnover is a problem. With the Peace Corps worker, it's not fast turnover. You're out there. Uh, you should be making a dent. I don't know what the problem is, but I don't think it's insurmountable. And uh, um, uh, you know, 
we, we apply our energies at many different levels. And so it's, it's, it's really a bit heartbreaking to see that where you can always use more money and you can always use more people. There really is, in a kind of general way, no lack of energy going into working on the water problem. But there are things like this cultural disconnect where we don't seem to make headway. And I don't know, I could be uh, uh, Pollyanna, but I think we can get past it. I think there's got to, I mean, we have too many social scientists who know how to overcome things like that. And this, you know, uh, we need to be careful not to see any humor in, a, in people going to a latrine and thinking that they'll be filled with evil spirits and they'll lose their reproductive powers. Um, uh, it's not a quick answer. I know what the problems are. I know how I think we can do it globally, uh, or you know, I know how we might do it in Uganda as a, as a country. But when you actually get down to the next door houses, the people in that village, and say, well, how are we gonna get over this? I don't know, it's, it makes me think a little bit about missionary work and the missionaries trying to get across uh, certain religious values. I think they're up against the same thing. Uh, but you really, the, the, the water and the sanitation are really holding these countries back. Uh, we, so I don't have the quick answer. I know it's a big problem. And uh, uh, I'd love to see more coordination, more people uh, not doing piecemeal projects that may work for a while, then the funding runs out, then you're all over the place. So that good question, though, I think underscores just how difficult it is. Okay, over here. Thank you. Uh, real quick, two things. They're actually using dry toilets in Peru for some, with some real success, which right. kind of gets over some of the, those challenges. Um, and they're also finding that in India there's a pilot project to dump waste that is then generated into electricity. So there's a motivation mm -hmm. to then collect the waste and dump it because you're able to then produce electricity. So there's a You a, mean a uh, uh, using the, the, uh, the, the waste to uh, cr create biofuel? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they're finding that. So s sometimes there are neat things like that. What I'm curious about is your opinion of tar sands and the use of water and the yeah. fact that they're building an infrastructure that will deplete all water within an entire region that actually the water will run out before the infrastructure is paid for. Meaning so that the, something like waste. the fracking issue where you need enormous amount of water to get the, get the oil out of the ground. And, Absolutely, fracking yeah. here in Ohio and Pennsylvania and then tar sands up in Alberta. Yeah. But we're both doing the same thing where we're depleting our water supply. In a developed country, how, how do we argue about that? Well, I think the way you're arguing about it and being, you know, more diplomatic and being uh, genteel here in this setting is that you need to raise the issue and make it clear to people that it's not simply a question of energy, but the impact of getting the energy and is this the kind of energy we want? Uh, and isn't there something else we could do? Uh, and, you know, not using energy seems a hard sell here in the U.S., but I have been impressed that hybrid cars and pure electric cars are making some headway now. Um, the uh, tar sands project has got so much big money behind it. Uh, it's, it's a daunting one. And uh, uh, some of the thoughtful publications around America have done some very insightful stories on fracking. Um, I, you know, my reflexive answer on everything is since I'm a journalist is to write more about it and write it more clearly and figure out how to actually touch people. So you don't want to write stories about tar sands or fracking that looks like a chemistry class, but you find some woman or man who's living some aspect of it and build a story around that so that people who wouldn't really know fracking from tar sands um, get engaged. And, uh, uh, you know, it seems to me <laughs> the options are you try your best in every way you can or you just give up because it is a, a very tough picture. And uh, if you don't, if you can't make yourself drive on and drive on, you know, it's so easy to quit. Uh, so I don't know much about quitting, so 
I'm uh, just one of those fools. Yes. Um, especially in light of the impending climate crisis, you know, we have rising sea levels. Uh, what's being in, being done in terms of desalination and preparation for that as opposed to just sanitation? Mm. Well, desalination is very expensive. I don't have any dollars to throw out at you, but uh, the place where it's most widely used is in the Middle East, where they spend a lot of money otherwise bringing water in by tankers uh, so the transportation costs are high. Um, uh, saline, desalination, I suspect, is going to become more widespread. It is, uh, it's, it's something that we can do as we get more population and we don't have any more water. We can literally make water out of the salt, drinking water out of the salt water. Um, but it's not a trivial thing, uh, the cost. Now, I live in Miami, Florida, and just up the coast in a town of Lake Worth, they put in a desalination plant. Uh, and the, they, they did that was because the aquifer uh, that affects Lake Worth uh, was getting saltwater intrusion. We, and that just means saltwater was creeping into the fresh water. Uh, so they, they set up a plant to uh, turn saltwater into fresh water. That was thought to be cheaper than trying to recover the aquifer, the part of the aquifer that was in trouble. Um, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think it, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if some terrific scientist comes along and finds a way to make desalination work more uh, inexpensively. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, if you take Africa, Africa, you take, take Kenya, for example, where uh, uh, you have a city like Mombasa on the coast. Um, you could put a desalination plant there, get plenty of ocean for you. But um, I think it's actually cheaper to do some of these other things with the, with the existing fresh water. It's fresh, meaning that it isn't salt water, but it's also unfresh in that it's awfully dirty. So if you, if you figured out a, a, a series of steps to take on cleaning the water and making it healthy for people, um, that would go a long way. Um, I just had a quick question about sort of what our direct impact is, like, you know, um, us taking, you know, 20-minute showers versus five-minute showers. What is our using too much water? Um, how is that affecting other parts of the world directly, I guess? Uh, a, a shorter showers here doesn't have a direct effect in Africa because we all have many climates and many water cycles. So the water that recycles in Africa is their water and not our water. What we do here at this point, it's essentially um, we're, we're getting in the habit now, or we should be getting in the habit of using less water. So as we get, as we, as water gets more scarce, uh, we'll know how to deal with it. So, uh, you know, we had a movie that we made at the University of Miami called One Water. And what our idea was that there's only one water and uh, everybody has to share it. Well, there is only one water, but there's only one water in your area, in this area, in the other areas. So uh, there is some kind of overlap at times. But mostly, uh, measures that we take with our own water supply probably aren't going to have a lot to do with the rest of the world. Um, it's, uh, uh, when I tell you tonight about what's going on in Africa and Asia, um, that's really aiming at your humanitarian side at your heart uh, and suggesting that you ought not to ignore it and you ought not to let other people ignore it. Uh, 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 but um, uh, there's no doubt that we're going to have a more, uh, we're going to have less water for our drinking as we go ahead. And um, I just advocate getting into the habit now. Uh, just an example I heard of just the other day. Uh, you know, one consequence of having less water is that we'll have to pay more for the water. Now, in a country like ours, having to pay more for the water is not that terrible. Nobody wants to spend more money on anything. But in Africa, uh, you know, you just don't have the money. Many, many people live on a dollar or two a day. So they are already getting ripped off by spending money. Remember that man with all those jugs on a, on a 
balance pole. Um, guys like that charge five or ten times what the price of water would be uh, otherwise. But somebody can't walk for it. They don't. They definitely don't have any plumbing. And uh, uh, here, so far, we've got money to spend on water. So. I was, and, and you know, it's hard for me to visualize, well, what's, this, what's less water here in this country going to mean uh, in terms of price? Um, well, I learned, heard this about Key West, Florida. Key West, Florida is at the very end of the southern reaches of the United States. There's a, uh, President Truman used to have a White House down there called the southernmost, the southern White House. And Key West is the southernmost point in the United States. So, People began to really move to Key West in great numbers after World War II. Uh, so they, they uh, around the time of World War II or a little later, they put in a big uh, culvert that brings water down from Florida. And then Key West got really popular. So there was only this one pipe and there were more and more people. And in what I think is a very good example, the water is now eight times what it was just a few years ago. So, not enough to break the bank, apparently, but uh, it's a lot more expensive to take water in Key West uh, than it is in Miami. And that looking at, thinking of that idea, one culvert uh, for a, whatever the number of people is, 50, 60, 100,000 people, and uh, just less of it to go around, that's a miniature example of what, what, what the U.S. is facing. We'll have less water, we're going to have to figure out how to, how to get everybody water, and it'll be rationed. It'll be rationed for people who can afford it. And then if we're really in bad shape, you will see people getting sick because they couldn't get fresh water and blah, blah, blah. So there's, it's a little grim, I think. So I think one more question, Joe. Okay, I'm, you know, don't, don't go home uh, with questions. I'm ready to talk. Pressure's on. I'll try, make, I'll try to make it fast in case anybody else has a question. Um, you know, hearing about the evil vaginal spirits and seeing women carry jugs makes me wonder what the men are doing um, through all this. And um, I happened to see a film at the Cleveland International Film Festival just this past year about women who took over their town. And yeah. they kind of threw the men out. You know, in, in what country? I, you know, did anybody else see it? I don't remember what country it was. But um, it's not a big group of women, maybe about 15, 20 women. Yeah. They threw their men out, and um, they run the town. Yeah. So I wonder if part of the problem is convincing the men that um, their macho-ness will not be threatened if there is clean water. Yeah. You know, there, will, there might be fewer children, you know, yeah. because... And you I know, think, you know uh, down the line. You really are on a very tight uh, uh, and very pointed cultural question. Um, it's every bit as hard as the as the spooky toilet story. You know, uh, maybe even harder because uh, uh, you know it is just not the practice for the men to go, go for the water. Uh, you know, it's a woman's job and it's a girl's job, and. Uh, how to get them to shift. I think you'd get them to use latrines faster than get them in to carry water. Um, so, I don't know. I have a feeling that what happens is, is that these kinds of uh, cultural problems fade and get, you know, the, the women get a uh, better status and the men take on more of the burdens that they should never have passed over to women anyway uh, as people get more money. Uh, these guys are so poor, it's just hard to believe. But uh, I saw a lot of people in these circumstances you're talking about, and the guys just don't, aren't, aren't up for it. And it's a real crime. The men? Well, they're hanging out. They like to take a nice rest. They, um, they, they are the farmers, uh, so they go work on the crops. Uh, but, uh, you know, I saw some very productive women farmers, and um, when you get a very aggressive and, and accomplished and achieving woman farmer, all the men farmer to get mad at her, uh, you know, uh, showing them up and so on. Um, the men may or may not be busy. I think I can't list off all the con countries where I'm thinking about this, but, you know, men are lazy dogs in lots of places. <laughs> 
And um, I don't see them changing, you know. Uh, even around here, how often do the guys take out the garbage, you know, so. So we don't want anybody to leave, leave if they have don't a question. Don't leave if you have a question. Do you want to follow up? Dr. Beadle, I didn't leave the microphone. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, as a journalist, or at least as somebody trying to get into the field, I'm taught in my journalism classes that I'm supposed to be uh, neutral and objective when looking at situations and things that I'm reporting. Right. When I see statistics in situations like this, it makes it very, very difficult. So I wonder, uh, how do you do it? Uh, do you subscribe to the same belief that uh, a journalist is supposed to be objective when they're reporting on something like this? Or do they need, uh, do they get involved somehow? No, it's much, I mean, our job is to spread the word, not to go out and uh, not to be the person who goes out and talks people into using latrines or taking a drink of water. The impact you can have is hundreds of times greater than the person who picks up the picket and walks around and wants action right now. You report on these things, they have great, great impact. Um, and you, whatever you have to say, you'll lose some part of the audience if you decide to be an evangelist. So what you need to do, which, which surprisingly is true, so many people do not have any facility for finding out what's going on. So if you look for an example at the presidential election, people got all sorts of peculiar beliefs about what Obama and Romney stand for. Uh, and um, you know, there's plenty of information out there to find out about it, but it just doesn't get through. So the reporters just keep shoveling the stuff out and uh, uh, trying to, they, the term objective is something that, that really we in journalism struggle with a long time. We like the concept of not taking sides, but we also don't want to be able to take uh, such an objective position that you uh, are forced to deal with nothing but hard facts and then when you have a lot of intuitive things or a lot of insights that people are giving you but they can't quite back them up with facts, well, you, you, you leave that out because you can't be objective. So we've gotten past that now. And that makes it tricky for people who, who don't know any better than we do, where's the line on objective? So the operating principle is you try to be fair and accurate all the time. You try to tell what you understand and what you know and you put you source it as clearly and as uh, as you can, but you, you it gets a little fuzzy at some points. But but you there, you're a long way when you're trying that kind of approach. You're a long way from someone who's writing editorials and saying this is the way you should do it. The best way for a journalist to do handle these situations is, you know, it's it's something akin to this talk I gave tonight, where I. I don't uh, say exactly what the, what's got to be done, but I say here are a lot of problems, and here, here are some things that you can do hands-on. Um, and then my job is to continue finding out how, how things are, and then put it in your lap so you can read it and make decisions. It's a, it's a, it's a very valuable service, and you lose the ability to have people on the right, the left, and the middle take seriously what you write if it sounds like you're from one of those camps or, you know, and, and, and I know that, uh, I mean, a lot of people now feel that's a limited way to do journalism and you can't really, you know, shouldn't you be doing more? I don't know how to persuade people that the fact is finding out what's going on isn't easy. It gets, dis the, the basics get distorted all the time, not through anyone's particular intention, it's just that a person whose who's objective, who's, whose goal is to find out what the facts are and lay them out for people, uh, it's not the way people live normally. Uh, you know, I was just talking to my brother the other day about uh, Romney and, o and Obama. Uh, you know, the thing, I don't happen to be a fan of Romney, and he is a fan of Romney. And the things that uh, he takes as gospel, you know, have been proved or disproved months ago. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I'm not saying everything about either of the candidates is right or wrong, but it's just that kind of ambiguity that people live with so much of the time. Most people aren't like reporters, and most people are not asking five and six and seven questions about something that seems obvious, you know. Uh, 
I hear the Cuyahoga's dirty or clean. Well, that's enough for most people. We want to know how dirty, how clean, what are you doing to make it better? Uh, and um, so you'll have plenty of work if you stay in the field. Yes, sir. Right. How do we self-segregate over a dozen, two dozen different sources, and we only talk to people in our own circle? It's think... sort of like the Washington problem. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife got me to the idea of listening to public radio. Yeah. And they had the Crokey Roberts and her husband on. They're on the city club. They blew the national NPR show away. And Crokey being Wade Boggs' daughter, Democrat from About the about the what? There was a congressman, a congressman, and then the woman to see the, the husband. They're Republican. And yeah. She said the most liberal Republican was to the left and the most conservative Democrat. Now the wings are torn in the middle apart. There is no middle. Anymore. Yeah, I think it's tough. I mean, I really dislike the discourse, the level of discourse in the country. A lot of nasty stuff, and. Uh, a lot of people with those 12 or 15 sources looking, looking, one of the, looking for what they want to hear. Uh, this problem with the internet for me is that uh, you, you, the fastest way to find things on the internet is to know what you're looking for. And if you know what you're looking for, then you lose the serendipity of turning on the nightly news or opening up the newspaper and as you're plumbing through the newspaper, you stumble onto things you weren't necessarily thinking about. So, uh, I don't know what the solution is. Uh, we in journalism are, are very interested in using every possible platform and finding out how to make the platform work, that is, how to reach people. Um, but just as a matter of mechanics, I think the internet uh, has a, a decisive, a, a divisive element to it in that you have to know what you're looking for. And if you know what you're looking for, by definition, you're going to miss some things. So I guess the, it's the, like some of the other questions here tonight, there isn't any final word. It's just that we can be together in a room like this and, 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 and talk and try to see if we can find any clarity ourselves. But it's, it's heartening for me to hear you talking about how you're not so happy with, with how far apart people have gotten. So, okay. Yes, sir. Have you heard of the EcoWatch Journal? I have heard of it, but I don't know anything about it. What, what should I know about it? They talk about the environment. They talk about Washington involvement, and uh, it's semi-local. Uh, is it produced here in, uh, in, in the Cleveland area? Yeah, the Echo Watch Journal. Yeah, well, you know, I'll I'll look at it. Uh, there's a, there is a lo there are a lot of outlets. The, a, a good thing about the internet is uh, almost everybody can have access, can produce things, and shoot it out to the internet. Uh, some of them, and I bet Echo Watch is one, are really worthwhile. And uh, when we in our publication, the Miami Planet, we have partnerships with other people on the internet and, and because many of us, have, of us have found with millions, literally millions of websites and, and uh, voices on the internet, um, instead of competing with Echo Watch or the Miami Planet, the two of us will put something on our website that directs you over to Echo Watch and vice versa. And so uh, um, there are some very strong and solid places. And, and you mentioned public radio. Public radio has got a very good NPR. It's got a very good web operation. And eco. Eco. Oh, instead of echo. Sorry. That's uh, probably a... Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for telling me that. On the internet and print. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm I'm on to it. As soon as I turn the corner here, I'll be turning on my computer.
So I think it's time to thank Joe for his visit with us. And uh, if anybody has any other questions, he'll stay for a few minutes. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. much. This is really very good. Thank, thank you very much again.